This is Noam Chomsky's 1959 review of B.F. Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, which was from 1957. This is one of the most influential book reviews in all of history. It was literally paradigm changing when it was written, the review, not the book. This is one of a few publications from around 1960 that's often said to have created the new field of cognitive science. This has been an interdisciplinary field spanning linguistics, psychology, philosophy, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and so on. Noam Chomsky himself has been one of the defining figures in this field generally, but in linguistics in particular. Interestingly, in 1992, someone did a study of what figures in the humanities and social sciences had received the most citations for their work since 1980, and Noam Chomsky was the most cited living person on that list. And interestingly, even among the non-living people, uh, the only people above him were Freud, Plato and Aristotle, Shakespeare, the Bible, and since this was still the 1980s when uh, the Cold War was still going on, Marx and Lenin were actually very highly cited in the Soviet Union. So Chomsky was in the top 10 most cited people at that time. He's fallen a little bit in the statistics now, but he's still an extremely influential linguist and he's still writing though there's some signs that perhaps there's a new paradigm shift moving away from his kind of work in recent years. Anyway, in this review, Chomsky uses the term behaviorism and mentalism for Skinner's paradigm and for his own paradigm. Although cognitivism is perhaps the term that's more often used these days rather than mentalism. Before I describe them, I'll mention that Chomsky himself sees this particular debate between behaviorism and cognitivism as part of a long running philosophical debate between empiricism and rationalism. I'll put a link to further discussion of this distinction below, but the basic idea is that empiricists claim that all knowledge comes through our senses, or at least most of our significant knowledge about the world primarily derives from our senses and experience while rationalists claim that pure reason or logic or intuition or insight can in fact reveal some of the most important truths. And so there are people like the rationalist Rene Descartes from the 1600s, who claims that the only reason that we can trust our senses at all is because first, I can prove that because I think, that means I know I exist, and then through further argumentation of this sort, he thinks he can prove that God exists and then that God is good. And once he's proven that, then he thinks now it's okay to maybe trust our senses as long as we do it only to the level that God would want. And, uh, and so Descartes puts his reason first and senses as secondary. Whereas empiricists like John Locke think that uh, reason isn't telling us anything about the world itself and instead, in fact, he thinks the mind is like a blank slate that isn't able to come up with anything on its own. Instead, it's just written on by experience in the world. And various versions of this debate have gone on for centuries. As I mentioned, those are figures from the 16 and 1700s, but it's, the debates continued in the centuries since and probably has precursors. Throughout recent history, most scientists have leaned more towards the empiricist side though there have been a few notable exceptions. And interestingly, probably the two most notable exceptions are the rationalists, Albert Einstein and Noam Chomsky. So behaviorism, which is the view that Chomsky is reacting against here, is a strongly empiricist tradition. And it is empiricist both about the minds that it studies and about how we study them. The way that behaviorism is empiricist about how we study the mind is that it says, the only data that we have about what's going on in the minds of other people or animals is their behavior. And so the behaviorists say, our theory should strictly be a theory of behavior and the external stimuli that cause it. They think surely there's probably something going on inside the head, but they think our scientific study has to focus on the observable things, which means the behavior, because this is the only thing that we can study objectively and have public availability for. And Skinner became famous as a behaviorist. He showed that with the right sort of rewards and punishments, you can reinforce certain kinds of behavior in animals 
And you can get really interesting and complex behavior from his famous experiments with rats and with pigeons. He showed that you could train them to find their way through a maze, but you can even do much more compl complicated things if you go through the right sort of reinforcement and uh, punishment. And uh, one of the projects Skinner was working on during World War II, he was interested in creating a homing missile for uh, the US military that they could use during the war. And the way it was going to work, he, they didn't have computers during the war. Instead, he was going to have a camera in the missile and a little room inside the missile where some pigeons would look at the screen and they would peck at the target and the missile would steer towards that target. So he was training pigeons to steer missiles. Uh, in his 1957 book, Verbal Behavior, which this is a review of, he's aiming to show that this sort of behaviorist paradigm could uh, in fact be used to explain even human behavior and in fact, even the most complex seeming of human behavior, namely language, which we often think of as the window to thought and the mind and these other things that the behaviorists are not interested in. So the behaviorists want to explain human verbal behavior, and they want to do so through the same kinds of general learning techniques that they think govern all animal behavior. Chomsky harshly rejects this view in the review, as you're going to see, and uh, he, like other rationalists, suggests that our own insight into our own minds is in fact a good way of getting knowledge about what other minds are like. And so he thinks we, can't, we can learn from more than just behavior. And he says, obviously verbal behavior is governed by all sorts of complex mental phenomena. There's beliefs, there's desires, there's intentions, there's other attitudes. And he thinks, these kinds of things are potential objects of scientific study, partly through indirect evidence via behavior, but also partly through introspection and other sort of first personal techniques. And perhaps more importantly, Chomsky rejects the other sort of empiricism that uh, uh, Skinner is into. Uh, Chomsky says the mind is not a blank slate and language is not governed by just the same learning mechanisms that govern all other behavior. Instead, Chomsky argues, there must be an innate language faculty that is specialized for language and that is shared among all humans. And he thinks this faculty gives children rational knowledge of how language works, even before they've been exposed to it. He thinks this is the only way that we could explain how children learn language so quickly. And he thinks this faculty is unique to language and distinctive of language, though, uh, the cognitive science paradigm generally thinks there are many such unique faculties. There's ones for vision, there's one for ones for language, there's ones for any other sort of mental attitude that we have. Only a small amount they think is universal mental behavior. Most of it is specialized. So he thinks, and another thing he thinks is that when we're studying language, we shouldn't be interested, we shouldn't be focusing on the actual behavior of particular individuals and the specific sentences that they utter, he thinks the thing we're really interested in is this language module itself. How does human language work generally, not how is the, what is this person going to say? And he thinks this module has to be finite so that it can fit in the head, but it has to be able to generate an infinity of sentences because on any given day, most of the sentences that you say and most of the sentences that you hear have probably never been uttered by any other human in all of history. And so somehow your finite language apparatus should be able to explain all of that. And he's interested in that infinite theory of language more than the specific sentences that you actually say. Now, a few things to note about this book review. It's very unusual as a book review. It's the full review is over 30 pages long. And this video is just covering uh, some selections from it that Chomsky helped uh, curate for a 1980 uh, textbook on uh, influential papers in the philosophy of psychology. And the tone of this book review is incredibly scathing. And some defenders of Skinner have argued that the view that it's criticizing is a caricature of Skinner rather than the actual Skinnerian view. And I've linked to one of the defenses uh, of, this, of the Skinner view against this review. Regardless of whether or not this is an accurate characterization of Skinner's view, this book review itself has been an, a very influential uh, text, and it presents the core of many of Chomsky's arguments 
for the cognitivist paradigm and against the behaviorist paradigm. Okay, so beginning, section one. A great many linguists and philosophers concerned with language have expressed the hope that their studies might ultimately be embedded in a framework provided by behaviorist psychology and the refractory areas of areas of investigation, that is the ones that are we're having a hard time fitting into this model right now, they say particularly those in which meaning is involved, things like language, thought, whatever, they hope that in this way they'll be opened up to fruitful exploration. Since this volume, Verbal Behavior, the one he's uh, uh, reviewing, is the first large-scale attempt to incorporate the major aspects of linguistic behavior within a behaviorist framework, it merits and will undoubtedly receive careful attention. Skinner is noted for his contributions to the study of animal behavior. The book under review is the product of study of linguistic behavior extending over more than 20 years. Earlier versions of it, that is of the book, have been fairly widely circulated, and there are quite a few references in the psychological literature to its major ideas. That is, people were referring to this book even before it was fully published because Skinner had been giving lectures based on it and many people had been sharing copies of his notes. The problem to which this book is addressed is that of giving a functional analysis of verbal behavior. By a functional analysis, Skinner means identification of the variables that control this behavior and specification of how they interact to determine a particular verbal response. That is, note, Skinner is interested in what makes a particular person say a particular thing at a particular time. And that's one of the questions that Chomsky is going to move away from in uh, his sort of linguistic theory. Furthermore, the controlling variables are to be described completely in terms of such notions as stimulus, reinforcement, deprivation, which have been given a reasonably clear meaning in animal experimentation. In other words, the goal of the book is to provide a way to predict and control verbal behavior by observing and manipulating the physical environment of the speaker. Skinner feels that recent advances in the laboratory study of animal behavior permit us to approach this problem with a certain optimism, since the basic processes and relations which give verbal behavior its special characteristics are now fairly well understood. The results of the experimental work have been surprisingly free of species restrictions. That is, he's shown much of this works in rats and in pigeons, so therefore across both mammals and birds, and they had duplicated much of it in many other kinds of animals as well, so there's hope that it'll apply to humans. Recent work has shown that the methods can be extended to human behavior without serious modification. And here's a footnote. Skinner's confidence in recent achievements in the study of animal behavior and their applicability to complex human behavior does not appear to be widely shared. In many recent publications of confirmed behaviorists, there is a prevailing note of skepticism with regard to the scope of these achievements. For representative comments, see the contributions to modern learning theory, uh, and then he says, perhaps the strongest view is that of H. Harlow, who has asserted that a strong case can be made for the proposition that the importance of the psychological problem studied during the last 15 years has decreased as a negatively accelerated function approaching an asymptote of complete indifference. That's an extreme negative uh, view of this. Nico Tinbergen, a leading representative of a different approach to animal behavioral studies, comparative ethology, Tinbergen's interesting. He won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1973 uh, for his work on animal behavior. I think it's very rare for someone working on uh, behavior to win a Nobel in medicine. He's also interesting because his brother and him are the only two siblings to have both won Nobel Prizes. His brother won for economics. So Tinbergen concludes a discussion of functional analysis with the comment that we may now draw the conclusion that the causation of behavior is immensely more complex than was assumed in the generalizations of the past. A number of internal and external factors act upon complex central nervous structures. Note, Tinbergen is mentioning both internal and external factors. The fact that he's referring to internal uh, factors is a sign that he is thinking ahead to the sort of cognitivist paradigm rather than the behaviorist one. Second, it will be obvious that the facts at our disposal are very fragmentary indeed. Okay, so back to the main text. 
It's important to see clearly just what it is in Skinner's program and claims that makes them appear so bold and remarkable. It is not primarily the fact that he has set functional analysis as his problem, or that he limits himself to the study of observables, that is to input and output relations. And uh, that's one set of important features of behaviorism. What is so surprising is the particular limitations he has imposed on the way in which the observables of behavior are to be studied, and above all, the particularly simple nature of the function, which he claims, describes the causation of behavior. As we're going to see, he just refers to reinforcement learning, basically, and suggests that that can somehow account for everything. One of the really interesting things in the very contemporary movement of uh, artificial intelligence on the basis of uh, deep neural nets is that they seem to be in some ways suggesting that uh, reinforcement learning may be sufficient to get a much larger amount of mental behavior than we would have thought, than Chomsky and the cognitivist would have thought. So here Chomsky says, one would naturally expect that prediction of the behavior of a complex organism or machine would require, in addition to information about the external stimulation, knowledge of the internal structure of the organism, the ways in which it processes inf input information and organizes its own behavior. These characteristics of the organism are in general, a complicated product of inborn structure. This is where Chomsky is going to suggest his language instinct fits in. The genetically determined course of maturation, so development as you age, and past experience. So that past experience is the part that the behaviorists have focused on. Insofar as independent neurophysiological evidence is not available, it is obvious that inferences concerning the structure of the organism are based on observation of behavior and outside events. Nevertheless, one's estimate of the relative importance of external factors and internal factors in the determination of behavior will have an important effect on the duration of research on linguistic or any other behavior and on the kinds of analogies from animal behavior studies that will be considered relevant or suggestive. So here he's saying uh, that Skinner is assuming a very strict restriction on how much can be going on inside the head. It's almost all, according to Skinner, reinforcement learning, whereas Chomsky thinks there's lots of distinctive things that go on with language, with thought, with other human faculties that are probably playing a role. Putting it differently, anyone who sets himself the problem of analyzing the causation of behavior will, in the absence of independent neurophysiological evidence, concern himself with the only data available, namely the record of inputs to the organism and the organism's present response, and will try to describe the function specifying the response in terms of the history of inputs. This is nothing more than the definition of Skinner's problem. There are no possible grounds for argument here if one accepts the problem as legitimate. Though Skinner has often advanced and defended this definition of a problem as if it were a thesis which other investigators reject. The differences that arise between those who affirm and those who deny the importance of the specific contribution of the organism, that is the internal factors, to learning and to performance, concern the particular character and complexity of this function and the kinds of observations and research necessary for arriving at a precise specification of it. That is, Chomsky is going to suggest it's more than just reinforcement learning. It's actually some features of a language module that we want to figure out the details of. And he thinks it's more than just look at the stimulus and look at what people say. Chomsky is also going to suggest doing things like, you should imagine your own sentences and decide, do those sound grammatical or ungrammatical to you? and use your own grammaticality judgments to identify the differences between uh, different parts of how this language module works. So he thinks internal evidence is just as good as external evidence. So if the contribution of the organism is complex, the only hope of predicting behavior, even in a gross way, will be through a very indirect program of research that begins by studying the detailed character of the behavior itself and the particular capacities of the organism involved. Skinner's thesis is that external factors consisting of present stimulation and the history of reinforcement, in particular the frequency, arrangement, and withholding of reinforcing stimuli, are of overwhelming importance, and that the general principles revealed in laboratory studies of these phenomena provide the basis for understanding the complexities of verbal behavior. <laughs>
He confidently and repeatedly voices his claim to have demonstrated that the contribution of the speaker is quite trivial and elementary, and that precise prediction of verbal behavior involves only specification of the few external factors that he has isolated experimentally with lower organisms. Careful study of this book and of the research on which it draws reveals, however, that these astonishing claims are far from justified. Here's Chomsky being extra scathing. It indicates furthermore that the insights that have been achieved in the laboratories of the reinforcement theorists, though quite genuine, can be applied to complex human behavior only in the most gross and superficial way. And that speculative attempts to discuss linguistic behavior in these terms alone omit from consideration factors of fundamental importance that are, no doubt, amenable to scientific study, although their specific character cannot at present be precisely formulated. And that's what Chomsky's research program is going to go on to try to do, to try to figure out what are those other factors. Since Skinner's work is the most extensive attempt to accommodate human behavior involving higher mental faculties within a strict behaviorist schema of the type that has attracted many linguists and philosophers, as well as psychologists, a detailed documentation is of independent interest. The magnitude of the failure of this attempt to account for verbal behavior serves as a kind of measure of the importance of the factors omitted from consideration and an indication of how little is really known about this remarkably complex phenomenon. The force of Skinner's argument lies in the enormous wealth and range of examples for which he proposes a functional analysis. The only way to evaluate the success of his program and the correctness of his basic assumptions about verbal behavior is to review these examples in detail and to determine the precise character of the concepts in terms of which the functional analysis is presented. Section two of this review describes the experimental context with respect to which these concepts are originally defined. Sections three and four deal with the basic concepts, stimulus, response, and reinforcement. Sections six to 10, which are omitted from this particular excerpt, they deal with the new descriptive machinery developed specifically for the description of verbal behavior. So we're going to skip that. In section five, we consider the status of the fundamental claim drawn from the laboratory, which serves as the basis for the analogic guesses about human behavior that have been proposed by many psychologists. The final section, section 11, which is included here, will consider some ways in which further linguistic work may play a part in clarifying some of these problems. Okay, section two. Although this book makes no direct reference to experimental work, it can be understood only in terms of the general framework that Skinner has developed for the description of behavior. Skinner divides the responses of the animal into two main categories. Respondents are purely reflex responses elicited by particular stimuli. So it might be something like an animal blinks in, uh, when it's, there's a bright light in front of it. That's not a learned behavior, that's just an automatic reflex response. Operants are emitted responses for which no obvious stimulus can be discovered. So basically anything else that the animal does that isn't an immediate uh, instinctive response. Skinner has been concerned primarily with operant behavior. The experimental arrangement that he introduced consists basically of a box with a bar attached to one wall in such a way that when the bar is pressed, a food pellet is dropped into a tray and the bar press is recorded. So this is, this is the Skinner box that is the basic uh, uh, model that Skinner uses for doing animal research. He sees occasionally if there's a bar in the cage, a rat will push it. And if food comes out when, uh, when you push it, the rat soon starts pushing it more often because the rat wants food. A rat placed in the box will soon press the bar, releasing a pellet into the tray. This state of affairs resulting from the bar press increases the strength of the bar pressing operant. The food pellet is called a reinforcer, the event a reinforcing event. The strength of an operant is defined by Skinner in terms of the rate of response during extinction, that is after the last reinforcement and before return to the preconditioning state. So that is what Skinner is interested in, is he says, I'm interested in why do animals do things and how, uh, how can we figure out why they do things? And he takes as his paradigm the case of a rat pushing a bar. And uh, he says, well, if I'm interested in when's the rat going to do that, 
let me just watch. How often does the rat do it? How excitedly does the rat do it? Uh, does the rat do it once and then wait a few seconds and then do it again? Or does the rat start doing it constantly over and over again? And, uh, and so that's the sort of thing that Skinner is interested in. And he's interested in how do various responses condition that? How does it, uh, uh, how does it reinforce or, uh, uh, or otherwise affect the rate of the behavior? Suppose that the release of the pellet is conditional on the flashing of a light. That is, the rat can push the bar at any time, but the bar only releases a pellet if you push it right after the light flashes. So then, in that case, he says, the rat comes to press the bar only when the light flashes. This is called stimulus discrimination. The response is called a discriminated operant, and the light is called the occasion for its emission. This is to be distinguished from elicitation of a response by a stimulus in the case of the respondent. So the idea is that the fact that the rat learns to uh, push the bar when there's a flashing light means that pushing the bar in response to the light is a different sort of thing than blinking its eyes when there's a light, which is a thing that it doesn't learn to do. It just automatically does. So, and here's a footnote. In Behavior of Organisms, Skinner remarks that Although a conditioned operant is the result of the correlation of the response with a particular reinforcement, a relation between it and a discriminative stimulus acting prior to the response is the almost universal rule. Even emitted behavior is held to be produced by some sort of originating force, which in the case of operant behavior is not under experimental control. The, distinguish between, the distinction between eliciting stimuli uh, uh, discriminated stimuli and originating forces has never been adequately clarified and becomes even more confusing when private internal events are considered to be discriminated stimuli. See below. And so here's Chomsky saying, Skinner makes these distinctions and maybe they seem clear enough for external things. They're probably not clear for internal things. And in any case, Chomsky thinks Skinner is committed to not using internal features. And so if you want to use internal features in your explanation of behavior, Chomsky thinks you should become a cognitivist. So now returning to the main text, suppose that the apparatus is so arranged that bar pressing of only a certain character, e.g. duration, will release the pellet. So maybe the pellet is released if you push the bar for one second and then release, but not if you push it faster or push it and hold it longer. The rat will then come to press the bar in the required way. This process is called response differentiation. Uh, by successive slight changes in the conditions under which the response will be reinforced, it is possible to shape the response of a rat or a pigeon in very surprising ways in a very short time so that rather complex behavior can be produced by a process of successive approximation. A stimulus can become reinforcing by repeated association with an already reinforcing stimulus. Such a stimulus is called a secondary reinforcer. And this is the sort of thing that you may have heard of in connection with uh, the early behaviorist Pavlov and his experiments with dogs. I won't mention some of his very early experiments with dogs for which he won the Nobel Prize because they're particularly gruesome. But eventually he realized, oh, there's interesting psychological stuff going on with dogs too. And the psychological work is what he's now famous for, where he showed, first, if a particular person is always the one who brings the food, then the dogs start salivating, not just when uh, the food comes, but also when they see that person. And then he noticed, well, now the dogs salivate whenever that person comes. If ringing a bell, if you always ring a bell before that person comes, whether or not they bring the food, the dog will now start salivating when the bell rings. And you can transfer the response further and further to additional reinforcers. Like many contemporary behaviorists, Skinner considers money, approval, and the like to be secondary reinforcers, which have become reinforcing because of their association with food, etc. Uh, here in the footnote, in a famous experiment, chimpanzees were taught to perform complex tasks to receive tokens, which had become secondary reinforcers because of association with food. Uh, so I think here the idea is there are certain tokens that the chimpanzees start salivating when they see because for a while they were presented with those tokens whenever they got food. 
And then later, when they do certain tasks, they're given one of those tokens and they start learning to do those tasks too because they associate those with food. The idea that money, approval, prestige, et cetera, actually acquire their motivating effects on human behavior according to this paradigm is unproved and not particularly plausible. Many psychologists, even within the behaviorist movement are quite skeptical about this. As in the case of most aspects of human behavior, the evidence about secondary reinforcement is so fragmentary, conflicting, and complex that almost any of you can find some support. And so here, I think the idea is uh, most people think the reason you want money is because you know cognitively that money can be used to buy things that you like. But what the behaviorist is saying is you just have learned to associate money with the things you like because money and those things are often in proximity to each other. And so you start liking money because it's associated with those other things that you like. And this is what Chomsky is saying is implausible. Secondary reinforcers can be generalized by associating them with a variety of different primary reinforcers. Another variable that can affect the rate of the bar pressing off print is drive, which Skinner defines operationally in terms of hours of deprivation. That is note, Skinner is not defining drive in terms of how strongly you want something, because that would be an internal factor that is not available to the experimenter to understand. Instead, what he does is things like he sees, he first trains the rats to associate pressing the bar with getting food. And then he notes, once they've done that, how often does a rat press the bar if the rat is well fed? But if you don't give the rat any food for 10 hours, now, how often do they press the bar? And uh, he suggests that uh, being deprived of the reward that they have associated with this action is going to increase the strength of the response. His major scientific book, Behavior of Organisms, is a study of the effects of food deprivation and conditioning on the strength of the bar pressing response of healthy, mature rats. And remember, the strength of a bar pressing response to Skinner is how frequently they do it, how likely they are to do it, maybe how vigorously they do it. And so those are all observable things. It's not, it's not a cognitive fact of how much the rat wants to push it, which is what Chomsky would be interested in, though, of course, we can't get into the mind of a rat to know what's going on. Probably Skinner's most original contribution to animal behavior studies has been his investigation of the effects of intermittent reinforcement arranged in various different ways presented in behavior of organisms and extended with pecking of pigeons as the operate under investigation in the recent schedules of reinforcement by Furster and Skinner. And this sort of experimentation is interesting. They note that if you get the pellet every time you push, that actually doesn't make them push the button as often as if you get it only some fraction of the time that you push. And many people have noted, this does seem to apply to humans as well if you ever look at slot machines, that people get really obsessive about playing slot machines because they sometimes get the reward. Whereas if, if you knew you get the reward every single time you pull, people often wouldn't be quite so compulsive about some of these things. And you might notice the same features of some of your own compulsive behaviors around whether it's the internet or whatever it is that you might find yourself uh, feeling compulsive about. Is it something where you're getting a payoff universally or intermittently. It's apparently these studies that Skinner has in mind when he refers to the recent advances in the study of animal behavior. Another footnote, Skinner's remark quoted above about the generality of his basic results must be understood in the light of the experimental limitations he has imposed. If it were true in any deep sense that the basic processes in language are well understood and free of species restriction, it would be extremely odd that language is limited to man. So that is Chomsky saying, if Skinner is right, that all the mental faculties that control behavior are just the same kind of reinforcement learning that controls all of animal behavior, then Chomsky says, why don't animals learn language all the time? Like there are dogs that grow up in households at the same time as children, they don't learn language. Uh, there are parrots that grow up in households at the same time as children, they learn to make the sounds of words, but they don't learn to speak. With the exception of a few scattered observations, Skinner is apparently basing this claim, the claim that language operates on the same uh, uh, mechanisms as other behavior, 
on the fact that qualitatively similar results are obtained with bar pressing of rats and pecking of pigeons under special conditions of deprivation and various schedules of reinforcement. One immediately questions how much can be based on these facts, which are in part, at least an artifact traceable to experimental design and the definition of stimulus and response in terms of smooth dynamic curves, see below. The danger is inherent in any attempt to extrapolate to complex behavior from the study of such simple responses as bar pressing should be obvious and have often been commented on. Although here, it's interesting to note that there has been much work in the behaviorist tradition uh, long after Chomsky's review of this book. It didn't fully destroy the behaviorist program by any means. And if you've done any sort of modern dog training or horse training, you've probably learned some of these more complex things that can actually elicit much more complex behavior than just bar pushing. But Chomsky's probably right that even if the same mechanisms are involved in bar pushing and pecking and many of the other things that dogs do, it's a stretch to go from that to therefore, therefore this must be what governs all behavior of all animals. Though this is also the sort of thing that scientists methodologically are committed to. If you find one type of explanation that manages to apply to a whole bunch of things, you should try to see if it could be made to apply to everything. Maybe you'll be wrong, but even then you learn something important. And if you're right, well, you never know until you test it. The dangers inherent in any attempt to extrapolate to complex behavior should be obvious and have often been commented on. The generality of even the simplest results has opened a serious question. See in this connection, Bitterman, Wodinsky, and Candeland, where they show that there are important qualitative differences in solution of comparable elementary problems by rats and fish. And that's an interesting thing to note. Maybe this works in birds and in mammals. Maybe it works in reptiles. Maybe it doesn't work in fish. Are humans in the category for which it works? That's an interesting question. Okay, so now back to the main text. The notions stimulus, response, reinforcement are relatively well-defined with respect to the bar pressing experiments and others that are similarly restricted. Before we can extend them to real life behavior, however, certain difficulties must be faced. We must decide, first of all, whether any physical event to which the organism is capable of reacting is to be called a stimulus on a given occasion, or only one in which, to which the organism in fact reacts. That is, is it a stimulus if you change something else in my environment, or is it only the things that I actually react to? This is a terminological question that is probably important for formulating the laws. Correspondingly, we must decide whether any part of behavior is to be called a response or only one connected with stimuli in lawful ways. So that is Skinner's observing when the rat is pushing the bar, but the rat's probably doing a lot of other things. Is it twitching its tail? Is it twitching its whiskers? Are those being uh, counted as behavior? Or maybe those ones just don't have any lawful connection to the stimulus, and so uh, Skinner is just ignoring them. Questions of this sort pose something of a dilemma for the experimental psychologist. If he accepts the broad definitions, characterizing any physical event impinging on the organism as a stimulus, and any part of the organism's behavior as a response, he must conclude that behavior has not been demonstrated to be lawful. In the present state of our knowledge, we must attribute an overwhelming influence on actual behavior to ill-defined factors of attention, set, volition, and caprice. Note that those are all internal mentalist cognitive notions about what's going on in the head as opposed to stimulus. If we accept the narrower definitions, that is stimulus is only the things that you react to, behavior is only the things that, respond, that occur in response to a stimulus, then behavior is lawful by definition if it consists of responses. But this fact is of limited significance since most of what the animal does would simply just not be considered behavior. Hence, the psychologist either must admit that behavior is not lawful or that he cannot at present show that it is, not at all a damaging admission for a developing science, or must restrict his attention to those highly limited areas in which it is lawful, e.g. with adequate controls, bar pressing in rats, lawfulness of the observed behavior provides for Skinner an implicit definition of a good experiment. So here Chomsky's given this 
dilemma, which is a common form of argument here. He says there's two ways to interpret these terms. If you interpret them one way, this makes a very bold and interesting claim, but it's one that is very far from being proven. If you interpret it another way, then it makes an almost trivial claim that is almost true by definition. And uh, Chomsky is accusing Skinner of going back and forth between these two uh, interpretations of the terms. Skinner does not consistently adopt either course. He utilizes the experimental results as evidence for the scientific character of his system of behavior and analogic guesses formulated in terms of a metaphoric extension of the technical vocabulary of the laboratory as evidence for its scope. That is, he's proven it for one range of things, and then he's hoping that it'll generalize to all sorts of others. This creates the illusion of a rigorous scientific theory with a very broad scope, although in fact, the terms used in the description of real life and of laboratory behavior may be mere homonyms with at most a vague similarity of meaning. This is Chomsky being very scathing again. And I think here he's probably being a little bit unfair. Skinner may be pushing this as a hypothesis rather than deliberately confusing the matter. And Chomsky may be misreading him to make it seem worse than it is, though I haven't read Skinner, so I can't say for sure. To substantiate this evaluation, a critical account of his book must show that with a literal reading, where the terms of the descriptive system have something like the technical meanings given in Skinner's definitions, the book covers almost no aspect of linguistic behavior, and that with a metaphoric reading, it is no more scientific than the traditional approaches to this subject matter, and rarely as clear and careful. Footnote again, an analogous argument in connection with a different aspect of Skinner's thinking is given by Scriven in A Study of Radical Behaviorism, uh, and see Verplank's contribution to modern learning theory for a more general discussion of the difficulties in formulating an adequate definition of stimulus and response. He concludes quite correctly that in Skinner's sense of the world, of the word, stimuli are not objectively identifiable independently of the resulting behavior, nor are they manipulable. For Planck presents a clear discussion of many other aspects of Skinner's system, commenting on the untestability of many of the so-called laws of behavior and the limited scope of many of the others, and the arbitrary and obscure character of Skinner's notion of lawful relation. And at the same time, noting the importance of the experimental data that Skinner has accumulated. Okay, section three. Consider first Skinner's use of the notions stimulus and response. In Behavior of Organisms, he commits himself to the narrow definitions for these terms. A part of the environment and a part of the behavior are called stimulus and response, and the stimulus can be eliciting, discriminated, or reinforcing, only if they are lawfully related. That is, if the dynamic laws relating them show smooth and reproducible curves. That is, Skinner is interested in how does the frequency with which you give the response, uh, the stimulus, change the frequency with which the animal produces the behavior? And if there is a good smooth curve that says, when I do it this frequently, the animal does it like this. And when I do it that frequently, the animal does it like that, where there's some nice shape to that curve, then Skinner says, we found a law relating stimulus and response. And only under those conditions in the earlier book does, stim does Skinner call it stimulus and response. Otherwise, there's just all sorts of things that happen in the environment and things that happen with the organism that just aren't treated by this. We can, in the face of presently available evidence, continue to maintain the lawfulness of the relation between stimulus and response only by depriving them of their objective character. A typical example of stimulus control for Skinner would be the response to a piece of music with the utterance Mozart. So that is, this is where Skinner is saying things in the new book, Verbal Behavior, new 1957, of course. So Skinner is trying to say, when people say words, why did they say those words? And he says, well, here's one word people sometimes say, Mozart. Why do they say it? They say it when they receive a certain sort of complex stimulus, namely certain kinds of music. And uh, there's another word they sometimes use, Dutch, which they will use in response to certain kinds of paintings. And Skinner says, 
these responses are asserted to be under the control of extremely subtle properties of the physical object of event or event. And this is where Chomsky is suggesting that, St that Skinner may be cheating a little bit in saying that there's some property of the music or the painting that makes you say Mozart or that makes you say Dutch. Because now Chomsky says, well, what if you didn't say Dutch and instead you said clashes with the wallpaper or I thought you liked abstract work or I never saw this one before or tilted, hanging too low, beautiful, hideous. Remember our camping trip last summer or whatever else might come into our minds when looking at a picture. In Skinnerian translation, whatever other responses exist in sufficient strength. That is, remember, Skinner is only interested in the behavior, the observable behavior, so the words that come out of your mouth, not the thoughts that are going on in your head. And Chomsky is saying that uh, there's no painting where every time you see it, you're going to just say the word Dutch. Maybe you will, but you'd be very unusual if that was the case. Instead, there, for any painting, there's many different things someone could say. And he thinks, if the word Dutch is one of those things, well, we could say that it's a response, but Skinner has to say that the response is only a response if it is frequent enough in response to the stimulus. And however frequent the word Dutch is in response to seeing that painting, there's probably a lot of other things that are equally as frequent in seeing that painting. And so Skinner is going to have to say all of those are responses that are somehow controlled by that painting. Skinner could only say that each of these responses is under the control of some other stimulus property of the physical object. If we look at a red chair and say red, the response is under the control of the stimulus redness. If we say chair, it is under the control of the collection of properties for Skinner the object, chairness, and similarly for any other response. So that is Skinner is trying to say, each word or each type of response is going to be under the control of some properties of the object. And maybe we can figure this out if we observe which objects produce which verbal responses by various, various people. This device of postulating a separate property for each word that is um, uh, being elicited as a response is as simple as it is empty. Since properties are free for the asking, we have as many of them as we have non-synonymous descriptive expressions in our language, whatever this means exactly. That is, you can just make up whatever word you want for something uh, uh, and say, that's the explanation. This is akin uh, to saying like, why does opium cause people to sleep? Oh, it's because opium has a dormative property, namely just a property of putting people to sleep. That's not an explanation. This is why Chomsky is saying it's an empty explanation. So he says, we can account for a wide class of responses in terms of Skinnerian functional analysis by identifying the controlling stimuli. But the word stimulus has lost all objectivity in this usage. Stimuli are no longer part of the outside physical world. They're driven back into the organism. So here Chomsky is saying that if you say that every single thing that a person might say in response to the painting is under the control of a different property, Chomsky is saying, well, you had no way of, re, uh, of scientifically, objectively identifying those properties other than by putting the person there and seeing what the person says. And so now it seems like we're really talking about something that's inside the person, not an objectively measurable property. And once you're talking about something inside the person, Chomsky is going to say, you should just be doing cognitive psychology, not behaviorism. So he says, we identify the stimulus when we hear the response. It is clear from such examples, which abound, that the talk of stimulus control simply disguises a complete retreat to mentalistic psychology, which is what Chomsky wants to do, of course, but he says Skinner can't be doing that if he's trying to be a behaviorist. We cannot predict verbal behavior in terms of the stimuli in the speakers of environment, since we do not know what the current stimuli are until he responds. Furthermore, since we cannot control the property of a physical object to which an individual will respond, except in highly artificial cases, Skinner's claim that his system, as opposed to the traditional one, permits the practical control of verbal behavior is quite false. So here's another footnote. So here on page 253 and elsewhere, Skinner repeatedly makes this claim. <clears throat> 
as an example of how well we can control behavior using the notions developed in this book, Skinner shows how he would go about evoking the response pencil. Before I say how that works, think about that. Skinner is claiming, we understand human verbal behavior enough that by using these systems, we can control what people will say in the same way that he says, we can control how the rat will work through the maze. We can control a pigeon in such a way that it pilots a kamikaze mission of a missile in the war. Maybe we can control what humans will say. And now he let's look at the effective means of control what, of what a person's going to say. He says, let's say we want to get the person to say pencil. The most effective way, he suggests, is to the, say to the subject, please say pencil. And our chances would presumably be even further improved by use of aversive stimulation, e.g. holding a gun to his head. <clears throat> that does, in fact, sound like a very effective way to get someone to say pencil. It's not a particularly interesting or novel way to get someone to say the word pencil. We can also make sure that no pencil or writing instrument is available, then hand our subject a pad of paper appropriate to pencil sketching and offer him a handsome reward for a recognizable picture of a cat. That'll get the person to say pencil. It would also be useful to have voices saying pencil or pen and blank in the background, signs reading pencil or pen and blank, or to place a large and unusual pencil in unusual place uh, clearly in sight. Under such circumstances, it is highly probable that our subject will say pencil. The available techniques are all illustrated in this sample. These contributions of behavior theory to the practical control of human behavior are amply illustrated elsewhere in the book, as when Skinner shows on page 113 how we can evoke the response red. The device suggested is to hold a red object before the subject and say, tell me what color this is. In fairness, it must be mentioned that there are certain non-trivial applications of operant conditioning to the control of human behavior. A wide variety of experiments have shown that the number of plural nouns, for example, produced by a subject will increase if the experimenter says right or good when one is produced. So that is, <clears throat> uh, you, the scientist tells the person, start saying words, and every once in a while the scientist says good, good. and if you say good every time the person says a plural noun, they'll start saying plural nouns more often. And uh, interestingly, uh, he says, uh, so he says, uh, for a survey of several dozen experiments of this kind, mostly with positive results, and it's of some interest, he says, that the subject is usually unaware of the process. So you can reinforce verbal behavior, but just what insight this gives into normal verbal behavior is not obvious. Nevertheless, it is an example of positive and not totally expected results using the Skinnerian paradigm. And I think what Chomsky is going to suggest is that this strange sort of case is the only thing that's interesting that Skinner is able to do. So other examples of stimulus control merely add to the general mystification. Thus, a proper noun is held to be a response under the control of a specific person or thing as controlling stimulus. And then Chomsky says, well, I have often used the words Eisenhower and Moscow, which I presume are proper nouns if anything is, but I've never been stimulated by the corresponding objects. That is Chomsky has never personally seen Eisenhower and has never personally been to Moscow, at least as of 1959. And yet he has said those words many times. And if Skinner says, it's the presence of the stimulus that causes the word, then Chomsky is saying, well, looks like something else must be causing me to say it other than the presence of the object. How can this fact be made compatible with this definition? Suppose that I use the name of a friend who is not present. Is this an instance of a proper noun under the control of the friend as stimulus? Elsewhere, it is asserted that a stimulus controls a response in the sense that the presence of the stimulus increases the probability of the response, but it's obviously untrue that the probability that a speaker will produce a full name is increased when its bearer faces a speaker. Notably, I might use the word you instead of Eisenhower if Eisenhower were right in front of me. I might be less likely to say the name Eisenhower if Eisenhower were present, which contradicts Skinner's basic 
description of what a stimulus and response are supposed to do. Furthermore, how can one's own name be a proper noun in this sense? Should I be saying my own name all the time? A multitude of similar questions arise immediately. It appears that the word control here is merely a misleading paraphrase for the traditional denote or refer. So here Chomsky is saying, people for all of history have used, had certain concepts for understanding language. They think language has meaning. They think that words refer to objects and they try to understand what's going on in those terms. Skinner is trying to replace this with what he claims is a more scientific and objective theory where words are produced by the presence of the thing that they denote, or not they denote, by the presence of the thing that controls them. And Chomsky is saying, no, that's obviously wrong. We get much better understanding of what's going on if we think in terms of denotation or reference. And Chomsky wants to turn that sort of talk into scientific talk rather than make up a new behavioral science of uh, verbal behavior. The assertion on page 115 that so far as the speaker is concerned, the relation of reference is simply the probability that the speaker will emit a response of a given form in the presence of a stimulus having specified properties is surely incorrect if we take the terms presence, stimulus, and probability in their literal sense. That they are not intended to be taken literally is indicated by many examples, as when a response is said to be controlled by a situation or state of affairs as stimulus. Thus, the expression, a needle in a haystack, may be controlled as a unit by a particular type of situation on page 116. And so now is that whatever, whatever that situation is that makes you say a needle in a haystack, is that a stimulus? Chomsky is saying, once you start calling that a stimulus, maybe the word stimulus has lost any object of meaning. He says, the words in a single part of speech, for instance, all adjectives are under the control of a single set of subtle properties of stimuli. The sentence, the boy runs a store, is under the control of an extremely complex stimulus situation, page 335. He is not at all well, may function as a standard response under the control of a state of affairs, which might also control, he is ailing, page 325. So there Skinner is claiming, there's a state of affairs that serves as a stimulus, and there are multiple responses that you might give in response to it. When an envoy observes events in a foreign country and reports upon his return, his report is under remote stimulus control. Note that here, Chomsky is drawing attention to the fact that the presence of the stimulus is no longer literal. The statement, this is war, may be a response to a confusing international situation. The suffix ed is controlled by that subtle property of stimuli, which we speak of as action in the past, just as the S in the boy runs is under the control of such spe specific features of the situation as its currency. Here Chomsky is suggesting that uh, he says, no characterization of the notion stimulus control that is remotely related to the bar pressing experiment or that preserves the faintest objectivity can be made to cover a set of examples like these in which, for example, the controlling stimulus need not even impinge on the responding organism. Chomsky is going to say, Let's understand these in tr traditional grammatical terms. This is about past and present and what the person wants to say. It's not a feature of the situation that is eliciting this response. Consider now Skinner's use of the notion response. The problem of identifying units in verbal behavior has of course been a primary concern of linguists. So here, what is the unit of verbal behavior? I think traditionally people have said it's a word. Modern linguists maybe focus on a sentence. Other uh, aspects of linguistics focus on the phoneme, the individual sound, or the morpheme, the smallest meaningful unit, and uh, maybe give up on the idea of word because words are actually much harder to identify than phrases, sentences, and morphemes. Uh, it seems very likely that experimental psychologists should be able to provide much needed assistance in clearing up the many remaining difficulties in systematic identification. Skinner recognizes the fundamental character of the problem of identification of a unit of verbal behavior, but is satisfied with an answer so vague and subjective that it does not really contribute to its solution. The unit of verbal behavior, the verbal operant, is defined as a class of responses of identifiable form 
functionally related to one or more controlling variables. No method is suggested for determining in a particular instance, what are the controlling variables, how many such units have occurred, or where their boundaries are in the total response. Many of these examples we've looked at have been talking as though the individual word is controlled by the stimulus. And one thing that Chomsky says elsewhere, though not particularly in this review is, well, if there's a bunch of words that are all associated with a particular painting, why don't those words just come out in a jumble? Why do they come out in a sentence if the, uh, unless the sentence is the unit? But if the sentence is the unit, then what's going on with the word? And this is the sort of question that Chomsky's linguistics is aimed at answering, whereas he thinks Skinner's linguistics, Skinner's verbal behavior has no way of getting at that. No method is suggested for determining in a particular instance what are the controlling variables, how many such units have occurred, or where their boundaries are in the total response. Nor is any attempt made to specify how much or what kind of similarity in form or control is required for two physical events to be considered, considered instances of the same operant. That is, does the word blue, is that the same event every time you say it? Or is one way of saying the word blue different from another? This may be particularly problematic if you think about words like bank, where the word bank has many different uses. Uh, and you might think they're under the control of different stimuli. But Skinner isn't giving us a way to identify which behaviors are the same behavior and which ones are different. In short, no answers are suggested for the most elementary questions that must be asked of anyone proposing a method for description of behavior. Skinner is content with what he calls an extrapolation of the concept of operant de developed in the laboratory, extrapolating it to the verbal field. In the typical Skinnerian experiment, the problem of identifying the unit of behavior is not too crucial. It is defined by fiat as a recorded peck or bar press and systematic variations in the rate of this operant and its resistance to extinction are studied as a function of deprivation and scheduling of reinforcement. Uh, the operant is thus defined with respect to a particular experimental procedure. This is perfectly reasonable and has led to many interesting results. It is, however, completely meaningless to speak of extrapolating this concept of operant to ordinary verbal behavior. Such extrapolation leaves us with no way of justifying one or another decision about the units in the verbal repertoire. That is, Chomsky's saying, when he's working with rats and pigeons, he's just looking at some very specific types of behavior that they make that are very easy to measure and identify. And there's no question, was that one bar press or two bar presses? Uh, that's going to be easy. And was it a bar press or was it a sip of water? Those are easy to identify. Whereas once you're looking at people using words, it's very unclear how to know, did you just use the same word? Did you use a different word? Is the word even the right level to be looking at or is it the sentence? Maybe you use the same words, but in a different sentence. Is that the same response or a different response? Skinner specifies response strength as the basic datum, the basic dependent variable in his functional analysis. In the bar pressing experiment, response strength is defined in terms of rate of emission during extinction. That is, if you, if you give the rat uh, food every time it pushes the bar, then you see how frequently does it keep pushing the bar even once you've stopped giving it food? Does it keep pushing the bar for many hours or does it only do it for a couple minutes? That's how you know how strong the conditioning was. And does it push the bar a lot or does it push the bar only once every once in a while? Skinner has argued that this is the only datum that varies significantly and in the expected direction under conditions which are relevant to the learning process. In the book under review, that is in verbal behavior, response strength is defined as probability of emission. This definition provides a comforting impression of objectivity, which however is quickly dispelled when we look into the matter more closely. The term probability has some rather obscure meaning for Skinner in this book. Footnote. And elsewhere, in his paper, Are Theories of Learning Necessary? Skinner considers the problem how to extend his analysis of behavior to experimental situations in which it is impossible to observe frequencies, rate of response being the only valid datum. 
His answer is that the notion of probability is usually extrapolated to cases in which a frequency analysis cannot be carried out. In the field of behavior, we arrange a situation in which frequencies are available as data, but we use the notion of probability in analyzing or formulating instances of even types of behavior which are not susceptible to this kind of analysis. There are, of course, conceptions of probability not based directly on frequency, but I do not see how any of these apply to the cases that Skinner has in mind. I see of no way of interpreting the quoted passage other than as signifying an intention to use the word probability in describing behavior quite independently of whether the notion of probability is at all relevant. That is, so we step back and say, Skinner normally sees how strong is the conditioning based on how much it increases the frequency of the rat pushing the bar. Now, if you try to move to a different type of behavior that rats do only very rarely, then it's not how frequently do they do it, but what's the probability that they do it at all? And then Chomsky's pointing out that when you move to other things, we're sometimes interested, what's the probability of a thunderstorm this evening? Or what's the probability of World War III breaking out within the next decade? And in those cases, we definitely can't talk about the frequency. Uh, instead, whatever we mean by probability is probably something in someone's head. And that's the sort of thing that he thinks Skinner isn't able to really talk about if he wants to be a behaviorist. And so he thinks Skinner is trying to use the word probability because it sounds like frequency, but Chomsky thinks that Skinner doesn't have a way of explaining the meaning of the term probability in any objective sense. So that's this criticism that's going on here. So he says, we're told on the one hand that our evidence for the contribution of each variable to response strength is based on observation of frequencies alone. At the same time, it appears that frequency is a very misleading measure of strength. Since for example, the frequency of response may be primarily attributable to the frequency of occurrence of controlling variables. That is, if, uh, uh, I mean, in the case where the bar push only gives you food when there's a light that's flashing. Well, now how often the rat pushes the bar is going to depend on how often the light flashes. Um, and now it is not clear how the frequency of a response can be attributable to anything but the frequency of occurrences of its controlling var variables if we accept Skinner's view that the behavior occurring in a given situation is fully determined by the relevant controlling variables. Furthermore, although the evidence for the contribution of each variable to response strength is based on observation of frequencies alone, it turns out that we base the notion of strength upon several kinds of evidence. So in one place, he said it's just frequency alone, but here's a place where Skinner says several kinds of evidence are relevant. In particular, emission of the response, particularly in unusual circumstances. That is, can you make someone say the word in a strange circumstance? the energy level or stress of this word, pitch level, speed and delay of emission, size of letters, et cetera, and writing, immediate repetition, and a final factor relevant but misleading, overall frequency. So Skinner mentions all of those things as ways of measuring how strong is someone's connection of this word to that stimulus. Now, of course, Skinner recognizes that these measures do not co-vary that is, they don't all point in the same way. Because among other reasons, pitch, stress, quantity, and reduplication may have internal linguistic functions. Footnote. Fortunately, Skinner claims, in English, this presents no great difficulty, since, for example, relevant pitch levels are not important. No reference is made to the numerous studies of the function of relative pitch levels and other intonational features in English. And here Chomsky is mentioning think about the uh, sentences, you're leaving, or you're leaving? Those mean different things. One of them is a question and one is a statement just because of the pitch. And so it's difficult to say that higher pitch of a word means higher strength because in Chinese, for instance, higher pitch just means a different word. And even in English, different pitch can affect the meaning of the sentence. Same thing Chomsky is going to suggest with stress and reduplication and number of times you say the word. However, he does not hold these conflicts to be very important since the proposed factors indicative of strength are fully understood by everyone in the culture. 
For example, if we are shown a prized work of art and exclaim, beautiful, the speed and energy of the response will not be lost on the owner. And so I think what Skinner is suggesting in that passage is he's saying, if someone shows you a painting, then if you just yell out beautiful and you say it quickly, that's impressing just how strongly you must feel it. But Chomsky says, it does not appear totally obvious that in this case, the way to impress the owner is to shriek, beautiful, 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 in a loud, high-pitched voice repeatedly and with no delay, high response strength. That's what Skinner's view seems to predict, that that would be the best way to show how strongly you find something beautiful. And Chomsky says, instead, it may be equally effective to look at the picture silently, have a long delay, and then to murmur, beautiful, in a soft, low-pitched voice, which by definition is a very low response strength, according to what Skinner has said. So that is here, Chomsky's saying, Skinner's defining strength of the connection in terms of these measurable variables that's supposed to make it objective. And Chomsky is saying, look, if we just look at those measurable variables, those just don't indicate anything like what we think strength is in terms of the response. It's not unfair, I believe, to conclude from Skinner's discussion of response strength, the basic datum in functional analysis that his extrapolation of the notion of probability can best be interpreted as, in effect, nothing more than a definition decision to use the word probability with its favorable connotations of objectivity as a cover term to paraphrase such low status words as interest, intention, belief, and the like. That is Chomsky saying Skinner thinks of interest, intention, and belief. Those are mental terms. And so those are not to be used in an objective scientific study. And Chomsky says, those are the things that a cognitive scientist should focus on. This interpretation is fully justified by the way in which Skinner uses the terms probability and strength. To cite just one example, Skinner defines the process of confirming an assertion in science as one of generating additional variables to increase its probability and more generally its strength. This, that phrasing of it is exactly the sort of thing that many philosophers of science will say. That is, what it is to confirm one scientific theory over another is to find some things that increase the probability of that theory. But now Chomsky's saying, if Skinner has defined probability as just the frequency of someone saying it, or maybe the strength with which someone says it, or the loudness or the high pitch, then uh, if we take this suggestion quite literally, the degree of confirmation of a scientific assertion can be measured as a simple function of the loudness, pitch, and frequency with which it is proclaimed. That is, there's nothing more to the probability than that. And a general procedure for increasing its degree of confirmation would be not doing an experiment that makes it more likely to be true, but for instance, train machine guns on large crowds of people who've been instructed to shout it. That's obviously not a way to support a scientific theory to get people to say it more often. A better indication of what Skinner probably has in mind here is given by his description of how the theory of evolution as an example is confirmed. So that is Chomsky saying, if you take what Skinner says literally, that looks like the best way to confirm a theory. Point a machine gun at a, bun at a big crowd and tell people, uh, say this theory a lot of times or else. But what Skinner actually says is, uh, this single set of verbal responses, that is the sort of things people say when they talk about evolution, is made more plausible. It is strengthened by several types of construction based upon verbal responses in geology, paleontology, genetics, and so on. We are no doubt to interpret the term strength and probability in this context as paraphrases of more familiar locutions, such as justified belief or warranted assertability or something of the sort. And in fact, that's exactly the sort of thing that my research is about, is about uh, understanding how probability can help us think about belief and vice versa. Uh, and Chomsky is saying, that's what a cognitive scientist should do, is take these mysterious scientific terms and interpret them in mental terms. But Skinner is trying to tell us to uh, replace this with something objective and scientific. Similar latitude of interpretation is presumably expected when we read that Frequency of effective action accounts in turn for what we may call the listener's belief, or that our belief in what someone tells us is similarly a function of or identical with 
a tendency to act upon the verbal stimuli which he provides. Footnote. The vagueness of the word tendency as opposed to frequency saves the latter quotation from the obvious incorrectness of the former. That is, if we look back there, frequency of effective action accounts in turn for what we may call the listener's belief. And Chomsky says, that's obviously false. There are plenty of people that believe things, even though it has not frequently worked out for them. Sometimes they're right because they believe something that they've never acted on. Like, I believe that the fire extinguisher will work to extinguish a fire. I have never actually seen it happen, but I believe that'll happen. So the frequency with which I've done it is not the explanation of my belief. And then Skinner also says, our belief in what someone tells us is, a is our tendency to act upon the verbal stimuli which he provides. And Chomsky says, maybe tendency to act is better than frequency. But he says, nevertheless, a good deal of stretching is necessary. If tendency has anything like its ordinary meaning, the remark is clearly false. One may believe strongly the assertion that Jupiter has four moons, that many of Sophocles' plays have been irretrievably lost, that the earth will burn to a crisp in 10 million years, and so on, without experiencing the slightest tendency to act upon these verbal stimuli. We may, of course, turn Skinner's assert uh, assertion into a very unilluminating truth by defining tendency to act to include tendency to answer questions in certain ways under motivation to say what one believes is true. But then Chomsky is saying, at that point, we're using the word believe and we're being cognitive, not behavioral. I think it is evident then that Skinner's use of the terms stimulus, control, response, and strength justify the general conclusion stated in the last paragraph of section two. The way in which these terms are brought to bear on the actual data indicates that we must interpret them as mere paraphrases for the popular vocabulary commonly used to describe behavior and as having no particular connection with the homonymous expressions used in the description of laboratory experiments. Naturally, this terminological revision adds no objectivity to the familiar mentalistic mode of description. Section four. The other fundamental notion borrowed from the description of bar pressing experiments is reinforcement. It raises problems which are similar and even more serious. In behavior of organisms, the operation of reinforcement is defined as the presentation of a certain kind of stimulus in a temporal relation with either a stimulus or a response. A reinforcing stimulus is defined as such by its power to produce the resulting change in strength. There is no circularity about this. Some stimuli are found to produce the change, others not, and they are classified as reinforcing and non-reinforcing accordingly. This is a perfectly appropriate definition for the study of schedules of reinforcement. Let's see the footnote. One should add, however, that it is in general not the stimulus as such that is reinforcing, but the stimulus in a particular situational context. Depending on experimental arrangement, a particular physical event or object may be reinforcing, punishing, or unnoticed. Imagine the bar pu pushing the bar gives you a pellet of food. For a rat who's in a cage with no food, that may be very reinforcing. But for a rat who's in a cage that already has all the food the rat could want, maybe that response is not reinforcing at all. Because Skinner limits himself to a particular, very simple experimental arrangement, it is not necessary for him to add this qualification, which would not be at all easy to formulate precisely. But it is, of course, necessary if he expects to extend his descriptive system to behavior in general. <clears throat> so he says, the calling a stimulus reinforcing uh, is defined as something that has the power to produce change in strength of behavior. This is a perfectly appropriate definition for the study of schedules of reinforcement, but it's perfectly useless, however, in the discussion of real life behavior, unless we can somehow characterize the stimuli which are reinforcing and the situations and conditions under which they are reinforcing. Consider, first of all, the status of the basic principle that Skinner calls the law of conditioning or law of effect. It reads, if the occurrence of an operant is followed by presence of a reinforcing stimulus, the strength is increased. As reinforcement was defined, this law becomes a tautology. So that is, if reinforcement as, is defined as whatever increases the strength of response, then the law just says, if the occurrence of an operant is followed by the presence of 
something that increases the strength of the operant, then the strength is increased. For Skinner, learning is just change in response strength. And C, for example, are theories of learning necessary? Elsewhere, he suggests that the term learning be restricted to complex situations, but he hasn't characterized those. Although the statement that presence of reinforcement is a sufficient condition for learning and maintenance of behavior, the statement that presence of reinforcement is a sufficient condition for learning and maintenance of behavior, this statement is vacuous. The claim that it's a necessary condition may have some content, depending on how the class of reinforcers in appropriate situations is characterized. Skinner does make it very clear that in his view, reinforcement is a necessary condition for language learning and for the continued availability of linguistic responses in the adult. So footnote, a child acquires verbal behavior when relatively unpatterned vocalizations, selectively reinforced, gradually assume forms which produce appropriate consequences in a given verbal community. So there, that sentence Skinner's imagining, babies make all sorts of weird sounds with their mouths, and when they get reinforced from their parents, when they, say, when they make certain sounds, they start making those sounds more often, and he thinks this is how language is acquired, that you just get adequate reinforcement when you make certain sounds. And further, differential reinforcement shapes up all verbal forms. And when a prior stimulus enters into the contingency, reinforcement is responsible for its resulting control. The availability of behavior, its probability or strength, depends on whether reinforcements continue in effect and according to what schedules. So there he's saying, once you've learned something, once an animal has learned something, they'll only maintain that learned behavior if they keep getting reinforcement for it. And so Skinner is suggesting that the only reason adults still know how to speak is because they're constantly getting reinforcement for the sounds that, that are coming out of their mouth. However, the looseness of the term reinforcement, as Skinner uses it in the book under review, makes it entirely pointless to inquire into the truth or falsity of this claim. Examining the instances of what Skinner calls reinforcement, we find that not even the requirement that a reinforcer be an identifiable stimulus is taken seriously. In fact, the term is used in such a way that the assertion that reinforcement is necessary for learning and continued availability of behavior is likewise empty. To show this, we consider some examples of reinforcement. And now here, Chomsky is going to give a list of places where Skinner has said some sort of verbal behavior has been reinforced. And Chomsky is suggesting, in most of these cases, the person was not given a pellet of food in response to saying it. They probably weren't even given some immediate pleasant uh, physical stimulus. Rather, whatever Skinner is saying is reinforcing here, Chomsky is going to say, we could understand that better if we just thought in mentalistic terms. And Skinner is trying to use the word reinforcement to pretend that he's not talking about mentalistic terms, but he is. First of all, we find a heavy appeal to automatic self-reinforcement. Thus, a man talks to himself because of the reinforcement he receives. And Chomsky is saying, what reinforcement did he receive? If you can reinforce yourself when you say something, why aren't you just reinforcing yourself always? The child is reinforced automatically when he duplicates the sound of airplanes or streetcars. The young child alone in the nursery may automatically reinforce his own exploratory verbal behavior when he produces sounds which he has heard in the speech of others. And again, in all these cases, Chomsky's saying, if by reinforcement you mean observable cheering behavior by the parents, maybe that's one thing. But in all these examples, Skinner's appealing to things that are not observable and calling them reinforcement. And so Skinner seems to be losing out on the apparent objectivity of his theory. The speaker who is also an accomplished listener knows when he has correctly echoed a response and is reinforced thereby. Thinking is behaving, which automatically affects the behavior, the behavior, and is reinforcing because it does so. And then Chomsky says, cutting one's finger should thus be reinforcing an example of thinking because cutting one's finger automatically affects the behavior and does so. And I'm not sure whether I did not see the context of that sentence, so I don't really know if Chomsky's right to say that whatever Skinner is claiming applies also to cutting one's finger. But if that's right, that is pretty damning. 
The verbal fantasy, whether overt or covert, is automatically reinforcing to the speaker as listener. Just as the musician plays or composes what he is reinforced by hearing, or as the artist paints what reinforces him visually, so the speaker engaged in verbal fantasy says what he is reinforced by hearing, or writes what he is reinforced by reading. That really sounds like he's saying the musician writes the music that he wants to hear, but Skinner can't say wants because that's not a behavioristic term. He has to say the musician writes some things and those, the, the, those things are reinforced somehow. Similarly, care and problem solving and rationalization are automatically self-reinforcing. We can also reinforce someone by emitting verbal behavior as such, since this rules out a class of aversive stimulations, or by not emitting verbal behavior, keeping silent and paying attention, or by acting appropriately on some future occasion. The strength of the speaker's behavior is determined mainly by the behavior which the listener will exhibit with respect to a given state of affairs. This Skinner considers the general case of communication or letting the listener know. In most such cases, of course, the speaker is not present at the time when the reinforcement takes place, <coughs> as when the artist is reinforced by the effect his works have upon others. Notice he's not saying the writer, the artist is reinforced by his imagination of the effects that his works have upon others. He's saying reinforced by the effects his works have upon others, even if the artist isn't there, maybe. Or when the writer is reinforced by the fact that his verbal behavior may reach over centuries or to thousands of listeners or readers at the same time. The writer may not be reinforced often or immediately, but his net reinforcement may be great. This accounts for the great strength of the writer's behavior. An individual may also find it reinforcing to injure someone by criticism or by bringing bad news or to publish an experimental result which upsets the theory of arrival, to describe circumstances which would be reinforcing if they were to occur, to avoid repetition, to hear his own name, even though in fact it was not mentioned, or to hear non-existent words in his child's Babylon, or to clarify or otherwise intensify the effect of a stimulus which serves an important discriminative function, and so on. From this sample, it can be seen that the notion of reinforcement has totally lost whatever objective meaning it may ever have had. Running through these examples, we see that a person can be reinforced even though he emits no response at all, and that the reinforcing stimulus need not impinge on the reinforced person or need not even exist. It is sufficient that it be imagined or hoped for. When we read that a person plays what music he likes, says what he likes, thinks what he likes, reads what books he likes, because he finds it reinforcing to do so. Or that we write, write books or inform others of facts because we are reinforced by what we hope will be the ultimate behavior of reader or listener. We can only conclude that the term reinforcement has a purely ritual function. Here's Chomsky being very harsh, again, ridiculing Skinner and saying that reinforcement is just his ritual invocation he has to make anytime he explains something when the cognitive scientist would just say, no, the person likes this music. That's why they're listening. And I write the book because I hope the person will do something, not because I'm reinforced by the person doing something. The phrase X is reinforced by Y, stimulus, state of affairs, event, etc., is being used as a cover term for X wants Y, X likes Y, X wishes that Y were the case, et cetera. Invoking the term reinforcement has no explanatory force, and any idea that this paraphrases introduces any new clarity or objectivity into the description of wishing, liking, et cetera, is a serious delusion. The only effect is to obscure the important differences among the notions being paraphrased. That is, Chomsky thinks, if we're willing to talk about liking and wanting and hoping and desiring and wishing, we should notice those are different concepts that are related to each other and investigate those differences, while Skinner is just trying to replace them all with a single concept of reinforce. Uh, once we recognize the latitude with which the term reinforcement is being used, many rather startling comments lose their initial effect. For instance, that the behavior of the creative artist is controlled entirely by the contingencies of reinforcement. Uh, so initially, when you see Skinner say that, that 
the behavior of a creative artist is controlled entirely by the contingencies of reinforcement, you're imagining, oh, the artist is basically just a lab rat who's being manipulated by the signals that other people are giving it. But Chomsky says, well, once you've looked at all the things that Skinner is calling reinforcement, actually all he's saying is the creative artist is controlled entirely by what he hopes and wishes and desires and wants and imagines. And that's exactly what we should have thought from the beginning. It's nothing surprising or cynical at all. What has been hoped for from the psychologist is some indication how the casual and informal description of everyday behavior in the popular vocabulary can be explained or clarified in terms of the notions developed in careful experiment and observation, or perhaps replaced in terms of a better scheme. A mere terminological revision in which a term borrowed from the laboratory is used with the full vagueness of the ordinary vocabulary is of no conceivable interest. It seems that Skinner's claim that all verbal behavior is acquired and maintained in strength through reinforcement is quite empty because his notion of reinforcement has no clear content functioning only as a cover term for any factor, detectable or not, related to acquisition or maintenance of verbal behavior. Footnote. Talk of schedules of reinforcement is entirely pointless. How are we to decide, for example, according to what schedules covert reinforcement is arranged? as in thinking or verbal fantasy. Are you getting that reinforcement every time you imagine or only some of the times? Is it like the slot machine or is it like the, the thing that pays out every time? Or what the scheduling of, of such factors as silence, speech, and appropriate future reactions to communicated information. All that scientific stuff that Skinner talks about with respect to the lab rats is missing here. Skinner's use of the term conditioning suffers from a similar difficulty. Pavlovian and operant conditioning are processes about which psychologists have developed real understanding. Instruction of human beings is not. And I think this is an interesting question. Has the psychological science of education and instruction progressed since 1959? I believe it has, though, again, not as much as Skinner might have thought. We don't have any similarly effective way to teach someone calculus as we have for teaching a dog to sit and stay. The claim that instruction and imparting of information are simply matters of conditioning is pointless. The claim is true if we extend the term conditioning to cover these processes, but we know no more about them after having revised this term in such a way as to deprive it of its relatively clear and objective character. It is, as far as we know, quite false if we use conditioning in its literal sense. Similarly, when we say that it is the function of predication, that is subject and verb predication, to facilitate the transfer of response from one term to another or from one object to another, we have said nothing of any significance. In what sense is this true of the predication whales are mammals? Is there some response you have to the word mammals that this sentence now enables you to have to the word whales? Or is it maybe some that rather you've enabled the word whales to respond to the same stimuli that the word mammals used to respond to? Or to take Skinner's example, what point is there in saying that the effect of the sentence, the telephone is out of order on the listener, is to bring behavior formally controlled by the stimulus out of order under control of the stimulus telephone or the telephone itself by a process of simple conditioning? If it's really simple conditioning, do I have to just tell you that over and over again until you learn to associate this? What laws of conditioning hold in this case? Furthermore, what behavior is controlled by the stimulus out of order in the abstract? Depending on the object of which this is predicated, the present state of motivation of the listener, etc., the behavior may vary from rage to pleasure. There are some things when you hear they're out of order, you're angry. There's other things when you hear they're out of order, you're happy. From fixing the object to throwing it out. From simply not using it to trying to use it in the normal way, e.g. to see if it really is out of order, and so on. To speak of conditioning or bringing previously available behavior under control of a new stimulus in such a case is just a kind of play acting at science. And there's Chomsky's uh, nasty uh, remarks coming out again. And at this point, we've got uh, uh, the, the jump where he's eliminated 
half of the review for um, uh, for conciseness in this 1980 reprinting. So section 11, this is the one where he, at the end, finally gives more of his positive theory. The preceding discussion covers all the major notions that Skinner introduces in his descriptive system. My purpose in discussing the concepts one by one note was to show that in each case, if we take his terms in their literal meaning, the description covers almost no aspect of verbal behavior. And if we take them metaphorically, the description offers no improvement over various traditional formulations. The terms borrowed from experimental psychology simply lose their objective meaning with his extension and take over the full vagueness of ordinary language. Since Skinner limits himself to such a small set of terms for paraphrase, many important distinctions are obscured. I think that this analysis supports the view expressed in section one, that elimination of the independent contribution of the speaker and learner a result which Skinner considers of great importance. So that is Skinner thinks it's really important to note that we no longer have to think of what's going on inside the head and what is distinctive of the speaker and learner beyond the general facts of reinforcement learning. He thinks that's very important. And Chomsky says that can be achieved only at the cost of eliminating all significance from the descriptive system, which then operates at a level so gross and crude that no answers are suggested to the most elementary questions. Footnote. For instance, what are in fact the actual units of verbal behavior? That is, is the word the unit? Is the sentence the unit? Is the paragraph the unit? What is the unit that is being controlled here? Under what conditions will a physical event capture the attention, be a stimulus or be a reinforcer? How do we decide what stimuli are in control in a specific case? When are stimuli similar, and so on. It is not interesting to be told, e.g., that we say stop to an automobile or billiard ball because they are sufficiently similar to reinforcing people. The use of unanalyzed notions like similar and generalization is particularly disturbing, since it indicates an apparent lack of interest in every significant aspect of the learning or the use of language in new situations. That is, Chomsky is interested in when do people think of things as similar enough to describe them with the same word? That's an interesting question. And he claims Skinner is just saying, it's similar, so they use it. It's not similar, so they don't. But not trying to explain what makes it similar in virtue of what is this more or less like the other. No one has ever doubted that in some sense, language is learned by generalization or that novel utterances and situations are in some ways similar to familiar ones. The only matter of serious interest is the specific similarity. Skinner apparently has no interest in this. Keller and Schoenfeld proceed to incorporate these notions, which they identify, into their Skinnerian modern objective psychology by defining two stimuli to be similar when we make the same sort of response to them. But when are responses of the same sort? And they do not seem to notice that this definition converts their principle of generalization under any reasonable interpretation of this into a tautology. That is, two stimuli are said to be similar if they produce the same response. And then they say, people give similar responses to similar stimuli. Well, that's just true by definition now. It's obvious that such a definition will not be of much help in the study of language learning or construction of new responses in appropriate situations. The questions to which Skinner has addressed his speculation are hopelessly premature. It is futile to inquire into the causation of verbal behavior until much more is known about the specific character of this behavior. And there is little point in speculating about the process of acquisition without much better understanding of what is acquired. That is, Chomsky is interested in what exactly do you acquire when you acquire a language? And Chomsky is going to claim you get a grammar and he defines a grammar in terms of a set of rules by which sentences are constructed out of words based on their syntactic categories. And then now that he's got that whole theoretical concept of what a language is, he can now say, how do children acquire language? How do they get that? Is it from their environment or is it from something that's innate? And Chomsky claims it's a mixture of these things. There's a lot that's innate that is helped along by the little bits of stimulus that the child gets. Anyone who seriously approaches the study of linguistic behavior, whether linguist, psychologist, or philosopher, 
must quickly become aware of the enormous difficulty of stating a problem which will define the area of his investigations and which will not be either completely trivial or hopelessly beyond the range of present day understanding and technique. In selecting functional analysis as his problem, Skinner has set himself a task of the latter type, something that's completely beyond the range of his uh, technique. If all he's doing is looking at what goes in and what comes out, he's not going to understand how languages work. Chomsky thinks you have to think much more carefully about what's going on inside the head. In an extremely interesting and insightful paper, uh, K.S. Lashley has implicitly delimited a class of problems which can be approached in a fruitful way by the linguist and psychologist, and which are clearly preliminary to those with which Skinner is concerned. Lashley recognizes, as anyone must who seriously considers the data, that the composition and production of an utterance is not simply a matter of stringing together a sequence of responses under the control of outside stimulation and intraverbal association, that is association between words, and that the syntactic organization of an utterance is not something directly represented in any simple way in the physical structure of the utterance itself. Here, Chomsky is noticing things like, uh, for instance, in English, we have this way of turning a sentence into a question. For instance, it is raining becomes, is it raining? You reverse the order of those two words. And if you, uh, if you take the sentence, John is at the door, and it becomes, who is at the door? Or if I said, I gave the ball to John, I say, who did you give the ball to? The word that you're asking about always gets removed and placed at the beginning of the sentence. And uh, Chomsky is thinking that the, the word is still related to the verb over here, even though it's now at the beginning of the sentence. And so the physical structure of the utterance, that is, which words come immediately before or after each other, doesn't tell you what's the syntactic relationship among the words, which word is controlling which other word. And so Chomsky thinks we have to understand something much more about what is going on at the deep level of language, whereas Skinner can't even talk about most of that. A variety of observations lead Lashley to conclude that syntactic structure is a generalized pattern imposed on the specific acts as they occur, and that a consideration, oh no, maybe this is, uh, Skinner, uh, a consideration of the structure of the sentence and other motor sequences will show that there are, behind the overtly expressed sequences, a multiplicity of integrative processes which can only be inferred from the final results of their activity. He also comments on the great difficulty of determining the selective mechanisms used in this actual construction of a particular utterance. Now, I think, I think this is Lashley, that is right. Although present day linguistics cannot provide a precise account of these integrative processes, imposed patterns and selective mechanisms, it can at least set itself the problem of characterizing those completely. It is reasonable to regard the grammar of a language L, ideally as a mechanism that provides an enumeration of the sentences of L in something like the way in which a deductive theory gives an enumeration of a set of theorems. Here, Chomsky is referring to results from the early 20th century in logic, where people noticed, you can say a finite number of things about natural numbers, that like every number has a successor, that the successor of a number added to something gives you the successor of what you would have had if you added those th things together. And from those statements, all the statements of arithmetic can be derived. And Chomsky is here thinking, well, Similarly, let's come up with a small number of rules and say from those rules, all sentences are derived. So for instance, a sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. A noun phrase consists of either a proper noun or a determiner plus a noun. And the noun can incorporate adjectives as needed and prepositional phrases. A verb phrase can either be an intransitive verb or it can be a transitive verb plus another noun phrase and so on. And so Chomsky is coming up, going to come up with all these rules. And this finite set of rules is going to generate all the sentences of the language, even though there's infinitely many sentences. And this language is ideal because, of course, no one has ever said most of those sentences. It's not a real thing that is actually produced by anyone. It's something that is implicit in the head. Grammar, in this sense of the word, includes phonology. And so here he's referring to various rules that say, um, 
when an N sound is in front of a K, it becomes an N instead of an N and, uh, and so on. Furthermore, the theory of language can be regarded as a study of the formal properties of such grammars. That is, it's not a study of what sentences actual people say in actual circumstances. It's a study of this ideal thing. And with a precise enough formulation, this general theory can provide a uniform method for determining from the process of generation of a given sentence, a structural description which can give a good deal of insight into how this sentence is used and understood. That is Chomsky's saying, notice the difference in the sentences, John loves Mary and Mary loves John. It's the same words, but it means something different. And it's because of the way it's built up from the parts. And his idea is the reason that you're able to understand sentences you've never heard before is because those sentences are built from familiar words in familiar ways. And you can identify that and follow those rules and derive the meaning. In short, it should be possible to derive from a properly formulated grammar a statement of the integrative processes and generalized patterns imposed on the specific acts that constitute an utterance. The rules of a grammar of the appropriate form can be subdivided into the two types, optional and obligatory. Only the latter must be applied in generating an utterance. The optional rules of the grammar can be viewed then as the selective mechanisms involved in the production of a particular utterance. The problem of specifying these integrative processes and selective mechanisms is non-trivial and not beyond the range of possible investigation. That is, it's not trivial. It's not just saying, oh, people say whatever they feel like, and it's, but it's not impossibly beyond the range of possible investigation. There is a real question here. What are the rules by which language works? And we can investigate it. The results of such a study might, as Lashley suggests, be of independent interest for psychology and neurology. And conversely, psychology and neurology might be of interest for the linguist. Although such a study, even if successful, would by no means answer the major problems involved in the investigation of meaning uh, and the causation of behavior, it surely will not be unrelated to these. Much of Chomsky's linguistics is uh, characterized by the fact that he focuses on syntax, the ways in which words are put together structurally, and thinks that semantics, the meaning, comes out afterwards and is somehow related to that, but uh, uh, he is not focused on that as much. It is at least possible, furthermore, that such a notion as semantic generalization, to which such heavy appeal is made in all approaches to language and use, conceals complexities and specific structure of inference not far different from those that can be studied and exhibited in the case of syntax. And that consequently, the general character of the results of syntactic investigations may be a corrective to oversimplified approaches to the theory of meaning. So Chomsky thinks syntax is this special level at which we can come up with a general mathematical theory of language. And if we do that, that'll give us some structure with which to investigate semantics, rather than trying to start with semantics or trying to do what, um, uh, what Skinner is doing and just look at the behavior itself. The behavior is going to be messy. Chomsky thinks the syntax can be a thing that is easier to study systematically. The behavior of the speaker, listener, and learner of language constitutes, of course, the actual data for any study of language. The construction of a grammar which enumerates sentences in such a way that a meaningful structural description can be determined for each sentence does not in itself provide an account of the actual behavior. It merely characterizes abstractly the ability of one who has mastered the language to distinguish sentences from non-sentences, to understand new sentences in part, to note certain ambiguities, etc. These are very remarkable abilities. We constantly read and hear new sentences of words recognize them as sentences and understand them. So that is, he's saying, my theory of syntax isn't going to tell you what someone will say. Instead, it'll explain how does the person construct that? How does the person tell apart the grammatical things from the ungrammatical things? Why does no one ever say uh, the in of chair dog? Uh, obviously no one does. And if you heard that, you wouldn't understand what it meant. And uh, he says, the syntactic theory can explain that. 
And this is a remarkable ability because you can tell that that combination of words is not a sentence, even though most of the other sentences that I've said in the course of this video are also sentences you've never heard, and yet they make sense to you, hopefully. We constantly read and hear new sentences, sequences of words, recognize them as sentences and understand them. It is easy to show that the new events that we accept and understand as sentences are not related to those with which we are familiar by any simple notion of formal or semantic or statistical similarity or identity of grammatical frame. Talk of generalization in this case is entirely pointless and empty. That is, he's saying, notice some sentences have three words, some sentences have 30 words. You can't figure out whether or not something's a sentence just by counting the words or just by lining up the parts of speech. You have to understand the structure. And Chomsky thinks a lot of that structure is actually innate and in the head. And that's why uh, we're able to do this. It appears that we recognize a new item as a sentence, not because it matches some familiar item in any simple way, but because it is generated by the grammar that each individual has somehow and has in some form internalized. And we understand a new sentence in part because we are somehow capable of determining the process by which this sentence is derived in the grammar. Suppose that we manage to construct grammars having the properties outlined above. We can then attempt to describe and study the achievement of the speaker, listener, and learner. The speaker and listener, we must assume, have already acquired the capacities characterized abstractly by the grammar. The speaker's task is to select a particular compatible set of optional rules. If we know from grammatical study what choices are available to him and what conditions of compatibility the choices must meet, we can proceed meaningfully to investigate the factors that lead him to make one or another choice. The listener or reader must determine from an exhibited utterance what optional rules were chosen in the construction of the utterance. It must be admitted that the ability of human being to do this far surpasses our present understanding. The child who learns a language has in some sense constructed the grammar for himself on the basis of his observation of sentences and non-sentences, i.e. corrections by the verbal community. That's a point that Chomsky keeps coming back to in his later work, that it's not enough to just see sentences, you also have to learn that certain things aren't sentences and that he thinks one of the best ways to understand what a language is, is to generate things that should be sentences on a simple theory, but aren't, and then come up with a rule that explains why they're not sentences. Study of the actual observed ability of a speaker to distinguish sentences from non-sentences, detect ambiguities, etc apparently forces us to the conclusion that this grammar is of an extremely complex and abstract character, and that the young child has succeeded in carrying out what, from the formal point of view at least, seems to be a remarkable type of theory construction. Furthermore, this task is accomplished in astonish an astonishingly short time, to a large extent independently of intelligence, and in a comparable way by all children. Any theory of learning must cope with these facts. This is all Chomsky giving what has later become called the poverty of the stimulus argument. That is, a child in just a couple of years from just the sentences that they hear people around them saying is able to construct a grammar for a language. And it doesn't matter how smart or how dumb the child eventually grows up to be. Everyone who is raised around speaking people uh, eventually gets the ability to speak unless they have a few very specific uh, uh, neurological problems. And, uh, uh, and so Chomsky suggests it can't be general intelligence that is helping you learn a language. It must be something special to language. And it must be something that's innate because uh, children do this uh, uh, way too quickly for it to be just learned from their environment. And, uh, and so he says, any theory of learning must cope with these facts. And also importantly, children do this all the time, but adults don't. If, if you were to drop me off in a household that just had a new baby and the adults in that household were speaking Mongolian to the children and to me, the child would learn Mongolian much faster than I do, even though the child doesn't even begin making sounds for the first year of their life. 
It's not easy to accept the view that a child is capable of constructing an extremely complex mechanism for generating a set of sentences, some of which he has heard, or that an adult can instantaneously determine whether, and if so, how, a particular item is generated by this mechanism, which has many of the properties of an abstract deductive theory. Yet this appears to be a fair description of the performance of the speaker, listener, and learner. If this is correct, we can predict that a direct attempt to account for the actual behavior of speaker, listener, and learner, not based on a prior understanding of the structure of grammars, will achieve very limited success. So that is Chomsky saying, let's not look at the problem of verbal behavior yet. Let's start with the problem of what's a grammar, what are all the rules and transformations that exist within it, and once we have that, then we can start to figure out how do people learn how to use this in practice. But this study of the abstract grammar, that's the thing that he thinks we should focus on. And that is something that is very much mentalistic and cognitive, not behavioristic. The grammar must be regarded as a component in the behavior of the speaker and listener, which can only be inferred, as Lashley has put it, from the resulting physical acts. That is, it's not in the physical acts themselves, it can only be inferred from them. The fact that all normal children acquire essentially comparable grammars of great complexity with remarkable rapidity suggests that human beings are somehow specially designed to do this with data handling or hypothesis formulating ability of unknown character and complexity. Footnote, there's nothing essentially mysterious about this. Complex innate behavior patterns and innate tendencies to learn in specific ways have been carefully studied in lower organisms. That is, if you look at birds, there are some birds where even if you raise them completely separate from other members of their species, they'll end up producing exactly the same sequence of sounds as their bird song. There are other birds where if you raise them with members of their species, they'll produce the same kinds of bird song as the members of that species. Uh, and different regions of the world though, those same species produce different types of sound. But if you raise that bird separately from anyone, it doesn't come up with any of that. And so animals do have some complex behaviors that are entirely innate and some where there seems to be a, uh, an innate faculty to learn. Many psychologists have been inclined to believe that such biological structure will not have an important effect on acquisition of complex behavior in higher organisms but I have not been able to find any serious justification for this attitude. That is, some psychologists think instinct can only be simple. And Chomsky's saying, no, instinct can actually be incredibly complex. Language, he wants to say, is an instinct. Some recent studies have stressed the necessity for carefully analyzing the strategies available to the organism, regarded as a complex information processing system. Uh, and in there, he mentions Herb Simon, uh, who's an important cognitive scientist. If anything significant is to be said about the character of human learning, these, that is these uh, uh, strategies available may be largely innate or developed by early learning processes about which little yet is known. Uh, they are undoubtedly quite complex. Okay, the study of linguistic structure, that is this abstract grammar, may ultimately lead to some significant insights into this matter. At the moment, the question cannot be seriously posed, but in principle, it may be possible to study the problem of determining what the built-in structure of an information processing or hypothesis forming system must be to enable it to arrive at the grammar of a language from the available, the available data in the available time. At any rate, just as the attempt to eliminate the contribution of the speaker leads to uh, a mentalistic descriptive system that succeeds only in blurring important traditional distinctions, a refusal to study the contribution of the child to language learning permits only a superficial account of language acquisition with a vast and unanalyzed contribution attributed to a step called generalization, which in fact includes just about everything of interest in this process. If the study of language is limited in these ways, it seems inevitable that major aspects of verbal behavior will remain a mystery. So this all, this review is Chomsky trying to argue why the behaviorist paradigm won't work and his cognitivist paradigm on which there's innate instincts uh, to generate these abstract structures that he thinks of as grammars, which then control the behavior. <clears throat> 
that is what he thinks is the, the better way forward in studying the mind. And this, this sort of cognitive paradigm has dominated psychology, linguistics, and related fields for the past 60 years or so. But as I've said, it's under new attack with the rise of deep learning and certain artificial intelligences that don't do anything quite as simple as the Skinnerian behaviorist uh, suggests, but do in some ways uh, appeal to simple domain general learning mechanisms that are like reinforcement, just with much more internal structure as opposed to just input and output.